Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Aisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim. And you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! What is up? It's your host, Elia Einhorn. Welcome back to the Talk House Podcast. We have a hell of a show for you this week. Julian Baker in conversation with Katie Harkin. To help me intro this episode, joining from the Windy City, it is the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend. Oh my God, I can't live up to that. It's Josh Modell, executive editor. What's up, Elia? (laughs) Hey, welcome back to the show. How's it been out there, man? Very warm. How about you? It has been fucking hot here in Philly. There's a thunderstorm going on right now, just in case listeners hear thunderclaps during this introduction. But uh, I'm excited to say that my family's headed back to Brooklyn this weekend. So we'll be living back at home. Nice. Brooklyn will be happy to have you back. We'll be happy to be back. I'll tell you. Listeners, the conversation on this week's show originally aired as the kickoff to the TalkHouse podcast live on Insta series that we've been doing during the time of social isolation. This time of year, we'd usually be on the road bringing talks to festivals all around the country. But of course, that was not to be this year. And we are so glad to be able to continue the live talks in this different way. Yeah, they've been great. They've been really fun and enlightening. The impetus for this conversation was the release of Katie Harkin's wonderful debut LP as Harkin, which came out in early May. Yeah. Now, Katie and Julian are big fans of each other's work. They've toured together over the years and we're super excited to catch up and chop it up with uh, some many hundreds of people watching. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really cool to see people kind of watching along and asking questions and dropping those hearts in there. I've been dropping hearts for Julian Baker since way back in 2015 when Sprained Ankle was just kind of a, an EP on Bandcamp. Julian's a Memphis-based songwriter of extraordinary power. Her songs cover everything from faith to sexuality to addiction. They're really incredibly intimate. This is some very self-lacerating stuff. Definitely. I mean, it, it feels a little like therapy, but not in a bad way. <laughs> and it's a lot cheaper. Exactly. Uh, she made a pretty incredible jump from Sprained Ankle in 2015, which was a very spare solo thing, to Turn Out the Lights in 2017, which Matador put out. Which more produced, more intricate, but also still like incredibly intimate and fantastic. And of course, a lot of our listeners are going to know Julian as one third of the indie supergroup Boy Genius, alongside Lucy Dacus and Phoebe Bridgers. It was incredible to have three amazing songwriters coming together in that way and producing something really just as good as anything they do on their own. Yeah, yeah. They're an incredible bunch, both as artists and as people. Boy Genius just released demos on Record Store Day last Friday to help three pretty amazing causes. Each member chose their own cause. Julian's was out Memphis. I mean, they're doing great work. Julian also dropped a couple of singles last year and supposedly is working on a new record for sometime this year. Rumors abound. It will spring immediately into my top 10, I have no doubt. Let's check out the single, Red Door. Every track she touches is amazing, Josh. Agreed. Now, I think it's fair to say the same about Leeds musician Katie Harkin. Katie has become one of the most in-demand musicians of the last decade. It's insane. After her band Sky Larkin called it quits, she wanted to tour as part of Slater Kinney, Wild Beasts, Flock of Dimes, and in Courtney Barnett and Kurt Vile's band. Katie also started her own record label, Hand Mirror. Yeah, she's even pitched it kind of as more than just a record label. It's really a creative community, a place for people to come together and and release anything. I cannot wait to see what they put out. I already know that there's one release on Hand Mirror that I adore. That's the aforementioned, widely acclaimed solo album, Harkin. From that record, let's check out the single, Mist on Glass. Love that record and especially love that song. I cannot doubt you now, Katie Harkin. (laughs) 
Julian and Katie get into a lot in this conversation. One very powerful element, the expectations of artists' creativity during quarantine. Yeah, and they also talk about the importance of taking control of your work as an artist in these uncertain times. We also hear Katie's plea to the music tech industry. We hear uh, some funny conversation about elitism in the already intimidating world of synthesizers. Plus, of course, with these two, John Milton and dick pics. You can never get away from John Milton and dick pics when you got Julian Baker and Katie Harkin in a room. (laughs) Should we roll it? Let's hear it. (gasps) She sent a request. View. Go live. Hi. Hi. I'm so glad. Hi. I'm so glad we found each other. I'm so glad we found each other. Yeah, <laughs> on the on the vast plane that is the internet realm. Yeah, this is wild. So there are people that are watching us now on Instagram Live, but this artifact will survive as a Talkhouse podcast as well. So yeah. um, if it bleeds into strange realms for either audience right now, then that's just the world we're living in. I was thinking about the thing that you said when you said that this was dragging us all kicking and screaming into the future, whether we (laughs) like it or not. And for me, that's been particularly salient. I, I feel like I had almost completely checked out of social media, like just for my own health. Mm. And then it became the sole way to communicate with people truly. Right. Like before the pandemic, you'd, you'd checked out of social media. Pretty much. Yeah. Except for communicating yeah. with the people in my immediate life, because I was just like, yeah. look, you know, I, I don't think human brains are designed to have this much information like crammed into them all the time at once, mm-hmm. like constant 24 hour news cycles and stuff. Yeah. But then now that it's not a choice anymore, you know, there seems to be like that privilege of liberty to make the choice to abstain from Mm -hmm. like putting a particular kind of media in my brain. But now I can't. Well, it's addicting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is addicting. There's these shiny things that are designed to be lustrous and Mm -hmm. we cradle them and we touch them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's also, I'm sure that after this Whenever we get over to the other side of this, that there's going to be, you know, studies looking at how digital literacy has like exploded. I'm grateful that you yeah. you came back from the digital woods. I was trying to remember when we first met. Yeah. Was it Minneapolis? Was it that like outdoor show? Was oh that gosh. the first show? Yeah, I forgot that that was even in Minneapolis because it was in like a nondescript like fields yeah. with all, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And I was terrified to have my tarot read because I thought I was going to get my soul stolen. And did you? <laughs> uh, turns out, no. <laughs> turns out, no. <laughs> was, it, was it already gone or, or? It was already gone. There was no, <laughs> there's no such thing as the immortal soul. No, I've been, uh, I've been reading Gravity's Rainbow too, which like <laughs> is always sending me into like a brooding, whole. (laughs) But I was going to ask you what you've been reading because that's what I've been asking everyone. I've been reading a lot of like how to stuff. Oh, cool. Um, Yeah. I, I need a lot of bandwidth for fiction. Like Hmm. I consume a lot more nonfiction than fiction. And like, I've, I've, feel that at the moment I haven't had that. And part of it's been, you know, record release stuff like positive and obviously like a lot of it has been just generalized anxiety for the world right now uh but I've been going between like teaching myself to cook new things to like teaching myself stuff about like synthesizers that I had put off for years generally not feeling very productive and not feeling like anybody should feel productive (laughs) yeah yeah that's an interesting thing that you get at because like And it seems to be a topic that conversations revolve around, especially when I catch up with folks on Zoom or Mm -hmm. um, what has been occupying your time now becomes this much more like momentous decision, you know, like even though there is now feasibly like a lot more like quote unquote free time, there's now this like weird underlying impetus to be creative all the time. At least I find for my friends who also are musicians or painters Mm or um, writers or things like, because the tasks that we do are already so sort of like unquantifiable, now it's hard to know what to do. 
Yeah, and because there's the kind of introvert-extrovert balance of being a musician, that yep. when you're home, it's supposed to be the introvert time, it's supposed to be the generative time, um, which also is just forcing the sort of parameters of product on our time right now. You know, it's why aren't you why aren't you generating? Um, and as you say, it's so difficult to to work out like how do you trap the lightning in the jar and the best thing you like I feel I can do sometimes is just keep feeding feeding the filter and seeing what comes out the other side oh. but realistically now the filter is also being fed with like a 24-hour news cycle with an event that even our grandparents haven't dealt with before if they're still around you know yeah and you talked about two things well like first that it feels like there is this element of urgency uh, for capturing the lightning in the jar, for capturing either just the um, the resource of time and using it to create something or, or just feeling like our worth or our work or the things that we create or even like the meals that we learn to cook, you know, mm -hmm. those are in some way quantifiable as a product or as a necessity. And also like just the terminology around what essential means, mm. you know? And I think there's a whole bunch more there to unpack than people maybe talk about frequently. No, yeah, definitely. Because I, yeah. th I think that um, our homes have changed from somewhere that we come to rest to somewhere mm -hmm. where we do everything. Um, and rest is part of it and work is part of it. Mm -hmm. And so rather than it become this sort of delineated thing like in our industry on tour or off tour um but for everybody else yeah like work and rest those lines being blurred I think mm -hmm. is unilaterally stressful you know definitely well and then it's funny because a lot of the professions you know even of people that you and I interact with and as the sort of jobs that are created by advanced technology increase like so sure now like things are more convenient but they also like create this weird job need of like people whose work is on their laptop and so they already were mobile and we were mm. like sliding towards this kind of like you said like we've grown more because we've just been kind of like forced over the slope into yeah what we had already been anticipating yeah. to totally and like I have used a laptop on stage before but I also know that it does sometimes feel difficult to make music on the same device that I do my taxes on like that's, oh my gosh yeah you know it's just psychologically impossible not to mm -hmm. like at some point separate that but equally I I can't stand it when people will talk about computers being cheating or some extended you know version of that uh, accusation oh, gosh, when yeah. they have you know guitar pedals with microchips in that were built by robots it's like at what point is what's authentic you know totally and and that's something else too that I think about a lot right now because of the way that sharing art across platforms, because I think it's easy and it was easy for me, God knows for a long time to just sort of like villainize social media, mm. um, like indiscriminately and just be mm -hmm. like, no, this is absolutely bad for us as humans. Mm -hmm. But then like, I was also one of those like anti-lap, not anti-laptop people, mm. but I just personally didn't see one in my set but the new record requires a lot more of like triggering certain loops and getting them all like centered so I had to learn how to use Ableton and yeah. like I don't know about like how you feel comfortable wise with like your setup on stage right now but mm -hmm. I yeah it took some adjusting the more toward the virtual realm I move, mm -hmm. generally the less comfortable I become. It was very intimidating to me for a long time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that would yeah. have, I think maybe a year or two ago, I would have just completely like unplugged because I was like, I don't know how to use, like, I tried to teach myself how to use Twitch <laughs> <laughs> to make music. I still stuff. haven't done it. I'm, oh my gosh. I'm going to do it. I've sent myself so many notes saying, get Twitch, question mark, but it hasn't happened yet. You know? <laughs> oh my God, you're it like me. Do. I have so many emails <laughs> from myself to do stuff that I'm <laughs> never gonna do. Oh God, they're awful. They're all just like, 
figure out Snapchat, <laughs> you know? Dude, it's no, like, I str- I'm here. not lying when I told you it took me so long to figure out Twitch and the person teaching it to me was like a young kid, like a kid. You can teach me then. I would have been a like camp a, counselor too. All right. Like, you know, keep the chain going. Yeah. You, know, you teach yeah. me and then I'll teach them else. We'll do a good old fashioned skill trade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, it's Elia again. Between tour cancellations, lost creative gigs, and shrinking ad revenue, the COVID-19 crisis is making it clear that the system supporting creative people is broken. It puts algorithms over ideas, quantity over quality, what's easy to sell over what's good, and money, brands, and just about everything else over the people who actually make the things that inspire us. But Patreon offers a better way. Patreon helps creators make up for recent revenue losses and build a more sustainable income source by offering a monthly membership to their fans. It gives artists the freedom to do their best work and the stability they need to build an independent creative career. Their fans get access to exclusive community, premium content, and the chance to become active participants in the work they love. As a fan, I support a number of artists on Patreon whose work I adore. Some of those include names you'll recognize from the podcast, like Beverly Glenn Copeland, Zola Jesus, and Prince Rama's Tarika. So if you're a podcaster, YouTuber, musician, writer, illustrator, look, if you're a creative person of any kind or or simply love one, now is the time to check out patreon.com to join the millions of fans and creators who are changing the way art is valued together. And now back to the show. I, I've had, most recently, I haven't had any laptops on stage with me, but a couple of times I have. And I think like a lot of tech, there's a lot more to it than just the, um, whether it's authentic or not. It's also having an anxiety of, do I have something on tour with me that I can afford to replace or that can break and I can somehow like carry on with the show Uh, because that's the other thing that obviously you know bands get bigger and they have more support available to them you know if people are able to get crew members for the first time then it means that that kind of level of worry um dissipates and I've certainly you know felt (laughs) felt more comfortable on stage when I've been in situations where there has been support for me um I mean I remember doing a show with this British band Wild Beast that I toured with and it was our first show of the tour and we played that outdoor festival in Austin which is called South by Southwest Uh, Austin Austin City City Limits Limits. Austin City Limits yeah and it hadn't rained all summer and there were all these signs outside of Austin that said pray for rain and the sides of the highways were scorched and then we started playing and the first note of the first song the heavens opened (laughs) and the rain came in onto the stage and the cr- I've never seen a crowd react like it. They went like fully feral because the whole city had been praying for rain and they Whoa. weren't prepared for it at the festival. The security guards were slashing down the advertising hoardings to throw over like big power bank things. Um, I didn't play on every song in the set. So in between my songs, I was grabbing stage towels and like <laughs> drying off keyboards and stuff and the stage computer that Tom was using as the brain for his whole sin set up, uh, dead, like totally dead. Dude, so yeah. first first show of the tour. So, you know, it we need to have this is my plea to the tech industry. We need like a synth brain thing for musicians that's also not like a three thousand dollar laptop. Like mm. there needs to be a better sampler synth like touring situation. Or, you know, send me send me some comments I'm sure people will <laughs> yeah but um <laughs> every, every time I talk about something to one of my like tech or gearhead friends and I'm like man if only I could just and then they try to send me like some Sweetwater mm. link that looks like one of those old computer servers from the 80s <laughs> and I'm like I'm not gonna f- yeah get that I'm not no. gonna get that <laughs> if it went yeah something that's will fit in my pocket or <laughs> um yeah yeah Well, no, and I think, I don't know, there is something about austerity and this weird elitism that forces people to, because, you know, within the world of synths, there's like, 
Oh my gosh. See, even right now I'm afraid to talk about it because I'm such an amateur because of our, I've started messing around with analog modular synthesis and yeah. it's so crazy. I got this pedal called the Zoya that's basically like a sequencer, but also inside. Have you seen it? No, you no, should, that sounds really fun. You should check it out. I don't know. Yeah. I've been trying to do that. I had like some, old, it was like a Yamaha DX7 and then like a Korg Volca. But what, awesome. have, what have you been messing well, around with? Well, I also have a great tip for people if you want to get into expensive synthesizers, which is find a studio that has expensive synthesizers and rent one day of their time rather than because they will have like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment and then you can go and play because I would love to be the person that has a epic analog synth collection but I don't have dude the uh, the space or the resources for it um dude, but I've yeah. been lucky enough to you know to go to studios that have it and then the more studios that I've been to it's made me think what am I doing? Why would I, why would I ever really build this? Like, what am I going to do? Fill my box room with like a fire hazard of stuff that I'm nervous <laughs> about getting robbed. Um, when really I should be like supporting studios and Dude. supporting recording engineers. So for my record, I did a lot of the modular synthesis stuff with a producer called Richard Formby, who mm. I met through Wild Beasts again, because they, they recorded with him. And he actually lectures in modular synthesis. Whoa. So he's no, like a... that's crazy. Yeah, so he's a producer that's been working with them like before they came back around to be cool again. And he gets all sorts of... Like he's mates with all the um, the producers and they send him the like blemish ones that they make because they know that the true modular nerds won't like anything that's like not completely perfect looking. Whoa. Um, but talking to him about it because it is his job to also be an educator to yeah. talk about it made yeah. me think like oh yeah also it's incredibly intimidating to me but it's also something to be massively respected because it it is like a whole other discipline and in so many other respects in the music industry we've been expected to be uh jack and jills of all trades oh um, totally yeah interdisciplinary you know. And then it's so expensive, like to mess around with something like real old synths, the whole like elitism thing comes back mm -hmm. into play of, of the austere, like the vintage synthesizers where yeah, like I am not going to go buy a Juno, but I could buy a little pedal from now that's like much more cost effective and models all those things. And that's exactly mm -hmm. the kind of consumer attitude I used to be vehemently opposed to <laughs> because... Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think there is some, maybe not even a sense of superiority, but of authenticity to it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, when you think about, especially modular synthesis, it's such a different realm for creation because you're building the sound from a sine wave. And you from electricity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, abs it's completely mathematic. It's so meticulous. It's very slow. Like it demands for you to switch your brain into a completely other part of music making. Because mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, if you're a person who is a multi-instrumentalist and like you were saying, like the music industry expects you to be Jack and Jill's of all trades and just kind of universally fluent in like music. That's something that you can't really do when you approach like creating a, the timbre of a noise. Yeah. 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 It's really cool. I would it's love like to coding. hear him lecture. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it very much is. It reminds me of circuit building. Mm. You just have to like put all the parts in their order. And it's so far separated from music. Like I used to make little like fuzz pedals with extra parts awesome. and stuff. Yeah, but like it's the same idea that it is vaguely musical, but not really all that. I guess it's a question of fluency and yeah. like what you feel fluent in and you know, when I, when I feel like I'm writing in the best way possible with the equipment that I have, it's like when it feels very transparent to me. Mm. Um, and then that transparency is something that takes time, usually, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a barrier. And I guess it's like any of this other tech stuff that we'd started talking about at the start, you know, like people didn't like novels when novels first came out, like, you know, when photographs first started, people were suspicious, you know. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I did 
I did read a fact once that Louis Daguerre's assistant was found, I think, 18 months after the invention of the daguerreotype, he was found selling uh, pornographic images in a park in Paris. So it just shows you like how quickly technology can be used for every single <laughs> whim of the human heart. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, the news story one day was people are using Zoom for uh, talking to their families and the next thing was, you know, people are a Zoom did they call it Zoom bombing or uh, hacking into people's Zoom conversations? Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that so, is immensely creepy to me. So there's one certainty to the human condition that whatever technology we devise, we will find a way. Oh, yeah. Isn't that's we like will. a John Milton quote, right? It's like man puts all best things to meanest use and worst abuse. Wow. I think you just won the pub quiz of this this conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is what, <laughs> there's no like cafe bar trivia. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yeah. No, that's one of, I, that's like a super bleak quote, but I remember reading that and being like, yeah, kind of. That's like the why we can't have nice things meme, but just in Milton's poetry, just like, yeah, yeah we're, we're going to ruin it somehow. Yeah, we're going to use it to take a dick pic eventually. <laughs> Like, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I have a couple of friends that are in the process of releasing music, and I don't know. It seems like an interesting place to be in. Yeah, I'm really grateful. I mean, I was already really grateful, but um, <clears throat> my partner and I started a label to release this record, and you know, part of it was to be able to support other artists and part of it was to um, make sure that I had the kind of creative freedom I wanted for releasing records, but I couldn't have anticipated that um, that would be sort of activated so instantly by me being able to make the executive decision to not push the album back because I feel like there's going to be artists that are unfortunately in that position that they're not ultimately in control of release dates mm -hmm. and that you know records are going to get shelved and so I am worried for other artists that that I don't want their work to get lost you know oh gosh yeah but I feel like with sort of social media and and things now people would kind of be able to champion for it and thankfully there is digital releases oh you know, it's yeah it's not just totally completely. mail order yeah um but I I think it it's a little worrying for well it's a lot worrying for a lot of things but one of the worries that I have for um the future for artists is how are people's releases going to get shelved or will they I yeah. you mean this in just the immediate future yeah, I think so. But it equally speaks to if all the tours are getting pushed and the venues yeah. are shutting down and then everyone's trying to rearrange their tours and their releases for the same weeks, then, you know, our ind independent artists going to suffer from that. Um, and how can we help those yeah. independent artists and like be aware that the small space for them to occupy has potentially like shrunk even further? That's true. Or, I mean, I think it could be either that or a case of, and again, like this is a phenomenon I had already started to see happen, but almost the, the accessibility created by the technology that we do have to like do di mm -hmm. digital releases and to share our music at like a ridiculously high quality compared to what we could do even just like 10 years ago mm -hmm. um, and just make it in our houses. Yeah, the space that we had to occupy got smaller... But in some ways, it's like th there's quite a bit of infinite space for musicians to occupy, but we're like maybe getting infinitely further apart with like little clusters of fragmented music tastes. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. there's no real dominant universal consumption of like the same stuff yeah. as much as there I mean, was. We, we kind of, you know, we're not exactly the same age, but we, we did both grow up with that kind of <clears throat> monoculture that preceded streaming and the and the internet yeah. and I there's a certain in a way it unifies the counterculture by there being a monoculture yes oh my gosh okay because there's a clear and discernible 
enemy or like um, not even an enemy, just a dominant culture. And if you are mm-hmm. the non-dominant culture, then you're the othered. And then, of course, you have like a unified, quote unquote, like oppositional entity. So, yeah. So now there's no monoculture. And I don't know if I necessarily think that's a bad thing, but it does. Put us, it is kind of difficult as you and I were both raised with like, well, you can be different levels of a successful band, but all of yeah. them are going to be on VH1's top 20 countdown at some point. And there's mm-hmm. not that many of them. Now there can be like people who just make lo-fi study beats to chill to or whatever. Yeah. That's, yeah. And then like are able to support themselves reasonably for that. Or people with like, you can just put up crap on your band cam. Like that's what I did. Yeah. And it's pretty, it's like scarily exciting because there's so much of it that you couldn't possibly like consume mm-hmm. it's the anxiety of, of not yeah. being able to consume it all I like scarily exciting and it's interesting what you're saying about how to group yourself now because I mean I, I grew up in a town that it didn't necessarily have like a sound like of what the band sounded like from that town so that the lineups for the sort of DIY shows could be quite varied because it wasn't like a town with one sound, if that makes sense. Like it was all just like, this is the warehouse space that we've got for the weekend. So the 12 bands that we can find to play the three pound all day will play today. So in a way, it kind of feels like that to me in a really refreshing way, rather than it being, if you want to play this showcase in London, it's for this kind of band Dude. and for this magazine. And if you don't sound like this magazine in this kind of band, then I'm sorry, there's no space for you. You know? No, totally. I mean, and I think it can have either, like, it depends on how people interact with the platform, right? Because it can have either effect. So I always talk about that's how Memphis was too. And I loved it that there was no real, awesome. like, I always describe it as if there's a school that's big enough to have, like, the lunch table where the football players sit and the lunch table mm. where the goth kids sit and the lunch table where the nerds sit, like, if you're, school is small enough there's only like one lunch table that you all just have to find a seat at and I felt like that was how we were a band that like sounded like if Uncle Tupelo tried to rip off Sunny Day Real Estate and it was so whack and we were just I've got to hear it (laughs) no it's really (laughs) it's it was very derivative on my part and anyway but like no I I think that's such a great metaphor and it it makes me think of the art room at my school because that's where I would hang out in the lunchtime and it was one of the places where like girls from different years would hang out together and it was like okay for us to be mixing with people that were in a different you know year at school to us and I made friends with this one girl who was two years above me um and we would all it was also one of the places where we would have access to a stereo the art teacher let us put things on the stereo um and one day this girl brought in a tape because she said this she said something like this reminds me of your your sense of humor uh, and she put it on and it was the Smiths and it was the first time and I was like and looking back I think about that and I was like wow it, it really says a lot about me uh, how chipper how chipper I must have been as a teen um but something about yeah the sort of the leveler yeah by being in a small enough environment that you have to mix with the uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's that's really powerful. That is really powerful. I quite like that. And then like now imagine if you took that small environment where there wasn't room for like a hierarchy to grow like in the petri dish of genres. Like now theoretically we couldn't enact that as in the way that we consume music. And I think we are. You know what I mean? Mm. I don't know if you were like this, but I mean going back to the sort of quintessential like high school experience like people separating themselves like into maybe superficial maybe not but just like Mm -hmm. certain groups according to like taste or like in your regular coming of age movie like Mm -hmm. cool kids and bad kids and kids that smoke pot and I don't see that really having a foothold or like it's not really precipitated by music taste anymore with my like little cousins and when I like 
talk to like my friends' younger siblings and stuff that it seems like that sort of confrontation doesn't really take up space in the like adolescent consciousness anymore, which I think is kind of sick. Like, it's very interesting because I still feel like I speak to uh, adolescents that listen to my music or bands that I've I've played with and like I still feel like there's a commonality there <laughs> but I totally know what you mean in that I think if the the sort of tribalism that uh, yeah. can be so comforting in music if that's um taken online it's maybe more imperceivable like it maybe it's just harder because it's not oh. just the five cds that you could get so you better like those five CDs because... Well, yeah, and also you th- I, you think about, like, aesthetic has become more important in some ways and then also less important in that, like, I used to have, like, $10 to get whatever CD and I just picked the one that looked mm-hmm. like it had screwed up metal font because that was bound to be something I was going to like. What's that font called? I like, don't know what Okay, that comment called. section. <laughs> comment section, this is why we're doing Instagram Live so we can, so we can ask you questions. <laughs> yes. So we can fact check. I'm going to ask you one question, maybe as the last question. When we were on tour together, I remember having a conversation with you about stage fright. How do you feel now as an artist whose performances have been pivoted to things like this, to to performing to a screen rather than two people? I will give you a short answer. I will say they make me really sweaty in a way that I was very shocked by. Like it's true, like actual performance fear sweat. It's not... I'm just talking, you know. Yeah. No, I um I do get nervous before shows. And I do because there's always like kind of like what we were talking about with the computer, you know? Like mm-hmm. my I'm always like catastrophizing that something's going to go wrong. But mm-hmm. there's something surreal where as a response to the anxiety of doing things like this where I know the magnitude of like how big the internet is it's comforting to think of like how small I am because I'm like oh how many people could have possibly seen me like turn on my Instagram accidentally and try to connect to you like I feel paranoid and Mm. extremely self-aware way more self-aware than I would just at a show and I don't know why that is Maybe we should stand on on the highest surface in our house like the (laughs) kitchen counter and then put the phone like as far away as possible and then just like get someone to move it around so it's in front of somebody else in the room. So it's just blocking their view. Yeah. And then <laughs> Okay. I was so nervous before this because these things are so alien to me, but this has really warmed my heart. So it's, really it's been my a real heart pleasure. <laughs> so great to see your face. Yeah, so nice to see you. Yes, yeah, nice to All see right, you. All right, well, everybody take mm-hmm. care, be safe. Be safe and stay whatever designated foot apart. And see you on the internet. Yep. Bye. Bye. Julian Baker, Katie Harkin, thank you so much for joining us here on the Talk House podcast. Listeners, make sure to check out the events tab on our site or our socials to make sure to stay up on the latest Talk House podcast live on Insta events. Katie and Julian were kind enough to record themselves today, as were myself and Elia Einhorn. And we've always got help from producer Mark Yoshizumi. Thank you, Mark. If you enjoyed today's show, definitely make sure to check out Katie Harkin on the Frightened Rabbit tribute episode from last year. And also catch Julian's bandmate Lucy Dacus in conversation with Dave Depper of Death Cab for Cutie. That's all in the archives. And over on the written side of the site, you can find an incredible conversation between Julian and Matt Berninger from The National, as well as a bunch of pieces written by both Julian and Katie. The TalkHouse podcast theme song was composed and performed by The Range. Till next week, I'm Elia Einhorn. I'm Josh Modell. Peace. And John Milton. <laughs>